by by the recordings on YouTube. So hopefully putting some of those things in, in one centralized location, maybe that will help to consolidate that for folks. That's still good to hear. That's a nice impact. Um, is this the first year for, for, for doing these kind of things for y'all? Virtually, yeah. All right, we're live on Facebook. I'm going to go ahead and mute myself. So hey, Dr. Laura, I see Steve has joined us. You, if you could make him a co-host so he could share his screen for his portion. Everyone, before we get started, if you could just type in the chat box one topic you'd like to learn or gain out of today, that would be great. Thank you. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's nine o'clock. We'll go ahead and get started. I see a few folks still joining us, so uh, hopefully we can can let those folks in through the waiting room and uh, get started here shortly. Appreciate everyone being here. BC Ag Today this morning on Thursday, October 29th, 2020. Uh, I think today is probably going to be a fairly rainy day for at least the folks in eastern Virginia and, and northern Virginia, so uh, hopefully, if, if you get a chance to watch this recording this afternoon or today or be with us live, great opportunity to, to learn some information on today's topic of fall vegetable pest updates. Uh, pleased to be joined this morning by Mr. Tom Kuhar, our extension entomologist for vegetables, as well as Steve Rideout, our extension plant pathologist for vegetable production. So thank you both for being with us this morning. Um, before we get started, just one or two housekeeping notes. Uh, as Laura mentioned a little earlier, uh, if you're joining us this morning, if you could just take a few minutes and, and put a little information in the chat box for us of uh, if you are a vegetable producer, uh, what fall vegetables you may have in the field now, but also uh, one thing that you hope to maybe learn from today's presentation uh, as far as for your production or maybe any questions you may have for, for both of our specialists. So with that being said, uh, We'll go ahead and get started in just one second. Um, if you do have a question or comment during the presentation this morning, we ask that you please hold those to the end of, of both gentlemen's presentations or add those to the chat window. And we'll certainly address all questions and comments uh, once the presentations have been given. So thank you all for being here. Thank you to our guest speakers and uh, Tom, Steve, wh whichever one of you'd like to go first. Uh, thank you for being here. Sure, thank you, Robbie. Um, Steve, I can go or you can go. Um, I'll let you make the call. Uh, if you want to go first, you can, Tom. That's fine. Um, okay, sure. 
I'm here, so. <laughs> All right, I'll go ahead and, thank you. I'll go ahead and, uh, uh, I guess we gotta stop the, um, it's gonna stop the other screen sharing. All right, hopefully y'all see my title slide. Yes, sir, Tom, looks great. Alrighty. Thank you, Robbie. And yeah, by the way, it's raining pretty heavily in southwestern Virginia too. I think our entire state's getting it. So um, good day to listen to Zoom presentations, I guess. All right, before I uh, get going on some of the things I'd like to talk about regarding pests and some current issues on vegetables, um, I do want to thank some of the people that helped provide the data. Um, and definitely my, my crew of grad students and and undergrads here in the Blacksburg area. We do a lot of work at Kentland Farm and, and um, you know, that whole farm crew putting in the vegetables has been fantastic. And then the Eastern Shore AREC folks, um, and especially Helen Dowdy, who oversees all our trials out there, um, still getting tremendous data from uh, the Eastern Shore. So it's definitely didn't want to save that for last and not get to it. I want to thank everyone up front. Um, so one issue that uh, I got Two different, um, two different people asking me what to do about this this year. So I'm guessing it has been an issue uh, with some of your growers. Um, and that is these, these dead, dead brassica seedlings could be broccoli, cabbage, doesn't matter. Um, and then you pull that thing up and then these little, these little maggots are crawling out of the stem, out of the roots. Um, had, had two different uh, emails about this. Um, and it is a it is a big problem. This is cabbage maggot, and this is a um, you know, kind of a house fly looking fly, but it's a little smaller, and um, can go through multiple generations in about usually less than thirty days. It's gonna it's gonna cycle through, and there's gonna be a new wave of adults. Um, adults lay their eggs at the base of plants, so they they find the brassica seedlings, drop their eggs in that soil. Um, and they're usually looking for high organic matter soil. Um, so they are the worst on organic farms that have really done a good job of building up organic matter. Um, but it's just perfect for these flies. So they, they lay a lot of eggs and then the maggots hatch and you see what it does to the, to the brassicas. So that's the, that's the problem. Um, what to do about it? Well, um, I will say that there's a lot of research that was done on, on can you spray foliar, like pyrethroids, like knockdown insecticides, broad spectrums. And the answer to that is that doesn't work. Um, it is like chasing, you keep spraying, the seedlings keep growing and the flies keep coming in. Um, and it's just, and you, and you end up missing them. It's just something that um, is just too, too difficult to do. So you got to put something down at planting. Um, and one of the best, Insecticides for this for, for over a decade has been chlorpyrifos and organic phosphate. Um, this is large band. And there's different ways of putting it down pre-plant, at plant. You can even go after you plant and work it in. Um, you've got to look at the labels. You've got to look at the rate for the different application method because these things do change. Um, but one thing I would like to say is that the manufacturer of large band, which is now the company Corteva, is no longer manufacturing or purifos, so no more lures ban. Um, however, they're not the only manufacturers of chlorpyrifos anymore. It's gone generic, so you see there's tons of different product names out there. Heck, you can get this. I can't believe it. It's, it seems like you can just get on Google and, and go buy a jug of chlorpyrifos um, manufactured somewhere. Um, but those products should still be around. So. Um, and it seems weird to start to talk by, by like I'm peddling an organic phosphate, but this is really the best insecticide for, for cabbage maggots, for a lot of the maggots. And, um, you know, it is apparently still available, but this is one that you got to, EPA may take away completely um, in some, in the, in, in the coming years here. So um, are there alternatives? If you don't want to put chlorpyrifos or if you can't get a hold of it, yeah, there are. Um, pyrethroids can go down. Things like Capture LFR, Sniper, um, other products, but um, they're okay. Lord's Band's probably a little bit better, um, but that is another option. Um, 
diazinons on there. It's another organophosphate that sometimes that's a little hard to get a hold of. But I want to do want to talk about Veramark because this is a completely different beast. This is a much safer insecticide, soil insecticide. It's a diamide. So just like Corrigin is a diamide. Um, and it, it's a lot safer for humans to be using, a lot safer on natural enemies and things like that. Um, the drawback is it's a little more expensive. But I do want to say one other thing with, with a product like Veramark, um, which now, by the way, is manufactured by FMC. It was a DuPont product. Um, yeah, this is systemic. So not only is it going to control soil insects, but it's going to move up through the xylem and move to the green tissue on the plant. And it provides um, control of a lot of different insects. So that gives you something that none of the others do as well. Um, why might that be important? Well, with brassicas, um, we have seen flea beetles get really bad in some years. Uh, it's particularly a spring problem, but these things can can go in into the fall brassicas as well, um, especially if it stays warm. And we have seen, so you got this kind of feeding going on on the leaves and, the, and they're tiny beetles and you're wondering, is this really gonna be yield loss? Is this gonna be significant? Um, I had a grad student looking at this, James Mason, and, and it was significant. Um, you don't see it, but you'll see it in the end when you take yield that these flea beetles feeding on those young plants ultimately result in smaller cabbage heads um, and just ultimately less less yield. So it's it's something to take seriously. Um, and something like Veramark will, it's just another shot. We got two main ones that are feeding on brassicas, the, the striped striolata flea beetle and then the crucifer flea beetle. Both of them are out there in kind of equal numbers. They both do the same thing, chew these little holes. So here's a trowel, goes back to 2015 now, but these were these soil applications. Um, there's a couple of neonicotinoids in there, Admire Pro and Venom, and then this Veramark, this diamide. Um, and we compared that with spraying um, every week with a, with bifenthrin, uh, pyrethroid. Um, actually, we only sprayed once, I'm sorry, with the pyrethroid. But, uh, you know, all of these treatments initially controlled beetles for about two weeks, um, moving into almost three weeks. So you, you can get pretty good coverage of protecting you, those young seedlings with, with all of these products. The, the neonicotinoid venom is definitely the best. It lasts the longest. But if you did put Veramark down, um, you would have flea beetle protection. So that's, that was kind of the point that I wanted to make. Um, something else that's going to be very important to brassicas, um, it's really hard to grow those in Virginia without having one of these worms show up. Um, and start to defoliate the plants and then be there later to infest the heads or, or um, whatever it is that you're ending up harvesting from your brassica crop. So, you know, these are the main ones that we see in Virginia. The one in the top left, diamondback moth, is the smallest, but the most important because it's the one that's most resistant to insecticides and the hardest to kill. Um, the rest of these pretty much can be taken out by a lot of different insecticides, but Protecting yourself against these lepidopteran pests is, is very important, as most of you know, if you've grown brassicas. So I did want to talk about some of these diamide insecticides that can be used as a transplant drench or um, put in drip chemigation. And it's a thing that a lot of growers have switched to and are, and are doing almost regularly. And, uh, you know, I think it's been a so it's been very good for them. They've, they've provided especially control of lepidopteran pests, um, really good control. And three of the products that you can use for lepidopteran pests are all diamides, Corrigin, Veramark, and Derivo. Um, just to give you an example, this slide goes back a ways, but it was one of the ones that kind of showed the power of these diamides um, put down in transplant water. And this was a cabbage trial done in, in the Eastern shore and just so a transplant water application of Corrigin gave you protection all the way up to harvest in, in cabbage. Um, this is the percentage of heads that had, that had worms that were damaged by worms and the controls on yellow and the two Corrigin rates are there and kind of the, the mustard color. And um, that was just unprecedented. We hadn't gotten that before and a lot of growers have seen benefits of using something like that. So that, that was a, 
it's a very positive and these are these are pretty good insecticides but we were all afraid of this and that is um well if they're going to last that long in a plant you know, or is something going to develop resistance to them? And, and the one that we feared was the one that has, and that's diamondback moth. 2018, um, visited a farm in Hillsville, Virginia. They had applied Corrigin and um, the plants looked like they hadn't. Um, they had a lot of diamondback moths on them still, the larvae, and went out there and, and uh, collected these larvae from this field. And brought them back, um, dipped some cabbage leaves in spray tank concentration of Corrigin, and then we did a control um, just to see whether Corrigin would in fact kill the worms. And actually 33% of them survived, and that's not good. The original bioassays we did, we got 100% control with Corrigin in a bioassay like that. So that was an indication that we do have some issues and it's even popped up in Virginia. And um, yeah, documenting it worldwide, Diamondback has and is developing resistance to, to diamides. It's showing up in um, big time in like the state of Georgia. Uh, but it, you know, as that slide, previous slide showed, it's also popping up in Virginia. So we, we've got issues with what was a pretty good class of chemistry working against the worms that we've got one now that seems to be developing resistance. So we got to manage this. Um, so rotating to different insecticides is, is definitely um, the way to do that. And using things that also enhance the natural enemies, um, basically don't, don't kill them is also a good thing because we get a lot of, a lot of control out of those as well. The good news is, um, and I've seen this in my 20 year career, is we have so many mode of actions, class of chemistries to attack worms, um, caterpillars. And here's just a, a slide of the groupings. The, the number, by the way, refers to the, the IRAC, I-R-A-C, the insecticide resistance um, classification number. And this basically groups insecticides according to their modes of action. It just shows you a nice diversity of options, a menu. Um, the one thing that most of these have is that they're pretty IPM friendly, um, except for the bottom left two, pyrethroids and organophosphates, carbamates, they are not. They're, very toxic, um, but everything else is pretty IPM friendly and a lot of different options. I do, while I have the slide up here, want to mention avermectins to the left. Um, this group uh, has a product called Proclaim Opti, which is a new formulation of Proclaim. It's a Emma mectin benzoates, the active ingredient. This has kind of expanded um, their, their label a little bit and I believe dropped the price. Um, so. This is an insecticide that's been around, but now they've kind of, um, they're enhancing it and making it more available. And it's a, it's a good option because it's a completely different mode of action. And then the bottom right, I want to mention Avant Evo. You may not have heard of that. Um, there was a product called Avant, and now there's a new one that's going to be called Avant Evo. What's the difference? Well, they've, they've changed how it mix, mixes. Um, they've gone to a, uh, a clay formulation rather than a more sucrose, it mixes a lot easier and they've expanded their label. So this is labeled on a lot more vegetables than it used to be as well. All very good worm caterpillar materials. So the options are, are, are terrific right now. Um, and that's a good thing. I do wanna say this isn't all of them and there's combo materials that mix two different classes of chemistry. All that kind of stuff is out there um, as well. Uh, but don't forget about BT. This is the one of the oldest lepidopteran worm materials, but still um, it's got a lot of good attributes. BT is, of course, the soil bacteria protein. Um, and there's different proteins, um, some in different strains of BTs like Kirstaki and Azawi. They, they are different products out there. Dipel, Javelin, Deliver, and Zentari and Agri have a different one. Um, these are really, really good for brassicas because they have to be ingested. Um, they're extremely IPM friendly because they don't harm anything else. And they really can get a good handle on the LEPs without wiping out the system. So I really encourage the use of these in brassica systems. I think it's an excellent fit and it kills a lot of the worms um, and does an excellent job. So there's that. Um, and the next thing I wanted to talk about is 
and I've mentioned these already, some of these soil applied systemic insecticides like the diamides and neonicotinoids. And I did want to put this slide up because I, I rattle through talking about these and I realized that it has gotten a little confusing for growers understanding what it is that they're putting out when. Um, so I just wanted to kind of go through this. One is the neonicotinoids. These have been around since the 90s and there's a lot of products, Admire, Platinum, Venom, um, that fit this bowl and a lot of a lot of other insecticides as well, um, generic versions of enmoclopid, for instance. But these are neonics target aphids, other homopteran type feeders like leaf hoppers, white flies, leaf feeding beetles, and bugs, things like squash bugs, harlequin bugs, um, as well as leaf miners. So they they do very well on all those insects. Also provide a little bit of soil insect control as well. That's a great pest spectrum. Um, but the one thing missing are, are the caterpillars, the lepidoptera. And so, you know, one concern with neonics is they don't give you anything for worm control, and that is true. So that's where the diamides are, are better. They're, they're outstanding. Um, great lep materials, things like Corrigin, Veramarks, the, the newer one. A um, little bit of leaf feeding beetles with the diamides. What are the other benefits of diamides? Well, they're the safest, especially Corrigin. Um, not going to not going to hurt the bees or the beneficials, um, but really you're, you're targeting your 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 leps. The Veramark is a little more broad spectrum. You're going to get things like thrips, aphids, um, and as we showed, it's really good for soil maggots as well. So another another option for a diamide, and then you got products like Derivo, which combines both a neonic and a diamide, and you basically get everything. Um, so. That's kind of a rundown of options that you have for, for soil insecticides. Um, and by the way, that was brassicas, and a lot of that applies to other vegetables as well, your fruiting vegetables. Now we're going to transition a little bit into some other things that came up this year, and it, this is related to cucurbits, some late season problems, and this was one. Um, my grad student, Sean Boyle, who, who did provide um, some of the slides that you're going to see for this, noticed his squash had this um, sometime in, in August. Uh, these were holes, um, little, I guess less than a, less than a pencil size diameter hole in a zucchini. And, and um, as you can see that on the pumpkin there with some sawdust like frass, this is, this is pickle worm, um, an insect that has, uh, become an issue here. It seems like about three years, three years in a row, we've had problems with it, um, which is kind of peculiar because for most of my career, it, it was not a problem. It was something that they dealt with in the South. Reasons are it's a tropical insect. It, it's far the sick and over winter is South Florida. So um, we shouldn't really be getting it, but we end up getting it, or we have the last three years, it's made its way up here. Um, later in the season. So this, this insect, you can see the moth there, um, which gives you an idea. If you see that thing flying around cucurbit fields, you know what it is. It's dropping eggs and flowers and the larvae are gonna feed, bore some holes as you see in the bottom left, and then ultimately will start burrowing into fruit, um, causing those holes and, and um, numbers can get really high. And it's really a late season, late season pest, although it's possible in Eastern Virginia Virginia Beach area that can arrive even as early as July. Um, this is something we need to deal with now. Um, good news is it's not hard to kill if you do spray, but timing the spray and knowing that it's out there is the challenge, but pyrethroids work very well. Um, they're cheap. They'll get the job done if, if they're applied in a timely manner um, and will reduce this fruit damage. Um, but and there's a tons of different pyrethroids out there, but the problems with those are that they are broad spectrum. You're killing a lot of things. You end up getting this happening more so than not in cucurbits, especially pumpkins. And that is outbreaks of aphids. Um, and then you got a serious aphid problem on your hand. Um, so you did a heck of a job keeping pickle worm out and, and some other insects. And now you got aphid problems and you got to deal with those. And I'm going to talk about that in a second. Um, but you spray your pyrethroids and you kill things like that lady beetle larva that, that was vacuuming them up and cleaning them up and the aphids are resistant to the pyrethroid and they just explode. So what are, what are some options then? What are, you, what are you telling me to do? I don't want the aphid problem. I don't want the pickle worm. 
Well, there are a lot of insecticides, these lepidopterin ones that I showed previously that, that do a heck of a job on pickle worm and, and do not kill the natural enemies. Um, here's just some options here. And uh, Helen ran a heck of a trial. We've never been able to get a pickle worm insecticide trial in my 20 year career working in vegetables, but we did this year. Um, so uh, she ran this trial in painter on zucchini and you see some of the products to the left and really bottom line is everything provided reductions of worms in the flowers, percentage of flowers that had holes and then ultimately what we most care about is percentage of fruit with holes. Um, we had about 16% damaged zucchini fruit in the control and virtually none when we put out one application of these, these uh, products. So we got things that work and that's, that's good to know, um, and an insect that we need to, but monitoring is gonna be really important, um, something I wanna work with in the future. But something else I saw this year uh, was just really, really high squash bug numbers. I don't know if you all saw the same thing in your areas, but squash bugs so high, um, there's the adult in the top left, by the way, laying eggs, little gray nymphs. They feed, cause, cause wilting um, as they kill the leaf tissue. I saw entire plants drop dead from so many squash bugs feeding on them, as you see in the bottom left corner. That was a wilted plant um, from squash bug feeding. Uh, that was bad enough, but then like, I didn't even realize how bad of a fruit feeding pest squash bugs could be. But if you ever see these little white marks um, on the top left, that's on a it's on a squash, zucchini squash. Um, that is feeding from the nymphs of squash bugs. And you may still be able to sell that, but I think when it gets too much, um, that's gonna hurt marketability. And Steve can talk about this, but we've seen diseases, some, some uh, like opportunistic bacteria and stuff that when you have those feeding wounds, it kind of opens it up to some other things that'll grow on there and really make that fruit un unmarketable. So. Squash bugs are a bigger pest than I ever thought. Um, and this year was, was just crazy, like killing plants, causing fruit damage. So um, again, you're left with what's the best thing for the squash bugs if you had them out there? Well, it was the pyrethroid. So you just got this, what's the best thing to spray? And it, it, might, it might be pyrethroids, um, just given your situation and your mix of pests that you have on these crops. Um, but one thing you might consider to avoid the aphid problems is throwing in an aphicide. Um, there's a lot of excellent, excellent materials that will just clean up the aphids. Um, and I'm not gonna show you, we do trials every year on peppers, squash, sometimes brassicas, um, tomatoes, we test aphid, aphicides like you wouldn't believe. Um, I'm not gonna show you those slides, but I'm just gonna tell you that all the products you see listed here are outstanding at controlling um, virtually all the aphids we're gonna get. And you know, some of the things then to consider are cost. You know, I can't tell you anything about that. It depends where you get your insecticides. Uh, a lot of these are gonna be a little bit, well, they're all gonna be more expensive than a pyrethroid, but they will control aphids. Pyrethroid will not. The other thing to think about is, is pollinator safety, and you see kind of some issues there. Actera is a neonicotinoid that would be bad to spray as a foliar when you got blooming flowers um, and, and bees visiting them. But a sale is, is much safer. It would be a safer option, for instance. Um, and then some of the ones in the bottom are much safer. So that's what I'm going to leave you with, um, but I will open it up. I don't know how. I'm doing on time, whether we want to do questions or whether we do them after Steve talks. Um, but I'll go ahead and stop sharing. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Appreciate you, you joining us and sharing those updates on, on the insect side of things. I guess we'll go ahead and let Steve do his presentation on diseases and, and then we'll open it up at the end for questions. And, and if we need to, we can pull the presentations back up to, to refer to certain slides if folks have questions on that. Okay, sounds good. All right, Steve, if, if you're ready, we'll go ahead and uh, have you share your screen and, and hear your comments on disease updates. All righty, thanks, Tom. Uh, thanks everybody for, for joining us today. 
Um, and uh, I have a few things uh, that I wanted to talk about. Um, and, and these are, are really neat. I've enjoyed doing this. And uh, uh, me and Tom actually have one later on today. Uh, it's something that uh, I think uh, both Tom and I have talked about doing more frequently throughout the growing season. And, you know, you look for, for good things to come out of 2020. And I think, um, you know, learning how to update our growers through various channels is, is wonderful. Um, what I wanted to talk about are, are things that I've kind of received uh, questions about within the last, uh, you know, seven, 10 days and uh, talk a little bit about planning to, to go forward um, and, and, you know, starting to think about 2021 already. Um, so first of all, I want to talk about Plectosporium and uh, pumpkin. And this was a huge, uh, huge issue this year, unfortunately. Um, and uh, it's something that we're doing quite a bit of research on, uh, both David uh, and I, uh, looking at trying to come up with uh, better management techniques. Uh, there's just not a lot known about this disease. Uh, it is on the rise. It's a little bit sporadic um, in terms of, of getting it so that we can do uh, trials on it quite frequently. Um, so it's frustrating to, to me, but uh, it's something that we certainly are working on um, through support of EDAX and Virginia Ag Council. Um, I like this picture, it shows the, the symptoms that you see on the leaf. Uh, and these are just really, really pinprick um, uh, lesions. Uh, you can see very, you know, tan shape, uh, tan circular, just pinprick. Uh, type of lesions and then you can look on these stems um, and you see these little little dots uh, that's plectosporium um, sometimes I think if you look over here to the right you probably have a little powdery mixed in there uh, but these discrete uh, pinprick type lesions that coalesce and make bigger ones uh, that's uh, plectosporium uh, the more damaging portion of it not that that can't do a damage to the uh, you know, the vines uh, and stuff in the field, but the more damaging part of it uh, from a marketability standpoint uh, is what you see on the fruit. Um, you can see uh, just again, these raised uh, tan spotting on the fruit. Um, it can be as little as, uh, you know, a few spots to pretty much where this pumpkin is almost looks like it's white because of it. Uh, so uh, you can see also in these infections on the stem and the handle. Um, you see a little greening here that's probably due to, uh, you know, premature vine decline. Uh, so you, you get uh, things like that going on. Here's a close up of what um, these uh, Puctosporia lesions look like on the fruit. Again, uh, they, they kind of start as uh, individual. Uh, lesions and then they can become large ones. And there's some variability about how these look um, on different cultivars and, and stuff like that. Uh, I think there are different strains out there. I think there are some, um, there's just a lot of stuff we don't know and we're trying to, uh, you know, play catch up some. Uh, here's a, a severe problem. Um, you can see where it basically has gotten into to this fruit very early. Uh, caused a lot of damage in the fruit, but look at this handle. Uh, it's just basically gnawed the handle away. Um, and, and this pumpkin just didn't even reach maturity. So uh, it, it was a bad year for it. Um, again, we're, we're trying to figure out a little bit more about it. Um, a few things that we can kind of, uh, you know, say and, and that we have learned. Um, you know, we know it's soil born. Uh, we know it survives on plant debris. Uh, it's typically something that we see more so in poorly rotated fields, but I'm going to tell you, this is not 100%. Um, and this year has been really frustrating because I know I've had some growers that, that uh, I know rotate pumpkin every, and cucurbits out every three years um, where they're on three-year rotation. Um, that had some bad plectosporium problems. Uh, I've also had uh, people that put pumpkins in a field where there's never been cucurbits to their knowledge. Um, and 
basically it gets annihilated with plectosporium. So this more and more, um, I, I don't really feel like rotation plays a, a, a big part in it. Now, with that being said, as a pathologist, I can't sit there and tell you not to rotate. So um, for this and other diseases. Um, it's favored by warm and wet weather. Well, we certainly had the, the moisture this year uh, with record amount of rains in some ports. So the Commonwealth. Uh, there are no resistant varieties, but there are some differences. We're kind of, um, you know, when we, we hit the uh, circuit this winter doing uh, grower meetings, I hope to have a little bit more data on resistant varieties. Uh, it's something that we really are going to be focusing on in the next couple of years um, through some of these grants. Uh, and again, not only can you see it in pumpkin, but you will see it in squash. Sometimes you'll see it in cucumber and some other cucurbits as well, but primarily pumpkin. Uh, and, and then again, probably next would be squash. Uh, so for control, um, what, what I'm recommending right now is basically a two to three year crop rotation. Uh, and that's just not for plectosporium, it's for things like fusarium. Um, you know, in the eastern and southern part of the state, southern blight. So uh, there, there are a lot of benefits to, uh, of course, rotation. rotation. Um, mulches, tillage, uh, you know, and, and we run the, the gambit on this one too, on tillage. Um, it was thought that no-till um, would help with plectosporium, but I've seen fields that uh, have no or reduced tillage really get uh, hammered by it. Uh, seen conventional fields, both ends of the spectrum too. So um, there's very little rhyme or reason. I, I do think um, the type of residue and the amount of residue has some impact on it. Uh, so plectosporium is a splash driven uh, pathogen. So it's in the soil. Uh, when you get heavy rainfall, it's going to splash and deplace some of that soil. Well, the soil is going to carry the plecto with it if it lands on your fruit or your plant. Uh, then you'll have infection. Um, so I think if you mulch really, really heavily, you could see some impact there on the splash. But it also provides an area for it to survive. So uh, there's no real rhyme or reason there. Do what best fits your system. Um, you know, and because I, I can't give you a consistent recommendation. So, but there are some fungicides that help. Um, Chlorothalonil or, or what um, has been called, you know, Bravo or is registered and, and marketed as Bravo for many years is, is, is good. It's a good start. Of course, that helps with other diseases too. Uh, the strobilians um, are kind of what uh, we have seen to, to be best on controlling plectosporium. And we've kind of stepped away from these the last few, probably decade or so. Um, just because, you know, powdery mildew is resistant, downy mildew is resistant, uh, and there were, you know, just not a lot of benefits for just spraying quadrus or cabrio out on your pumpkins uh, because we had these resistance problems and others. Uh, but these are the materials that kind of work on plectosporium is what we're seeing. And then we will have some more information, hopefully in the next couple of years, uh, more specific, but just to kind of summarize, this is, this is what we have right now. Um, in the last part, I actually want to talk about sanitation of infield equipment. And, and you learn um, with disease, you learn every year. Um, I've learned a lot about plectosporium this year. Um, I've actually seen um, things like lay flat irrigation hose, um, you know, that, that has been utilized over and over in pumpkin fields. Um, I've seen disease be worse around it, um, so that would indicate that, you know, and I know that hose wasn't clean from the prior year, uh, but it indicates that you could have, you know, potentially if you have debris on it from previous seasons, uh, it can overwinter in that debris, and, and if you put it into the field, that can be an inoculation source. Um, so it's just something to think about, uh, you know, for the future. Um, around this time every year, I get uh, people asking, well, how do I make my pumpkin uh, last the longest? Um, and, you know, some of this is for marketing. 
Um, and some of it's just for personal use. People want their pumpkins to make it to Thanksgiving. Um, and wow, the, the, the demand in pumpkin, Virginia grown pumpkins has been so great this year. Uh, so you want to make them last. Uh, and so just want to go over the storage parameters that are best to maintain pumpkin integrity. Uh, 50 to 55 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, you want about 50 to 75 percent relative humidity, um, you know, to, to keep it in good shape and, and avoid, you know, having it open to the elements. Um, avoid injuring the fruit the best you can uh, if you're placing it into storage. And, and one of the things that I often get questions about, okay, well, I harvested the fruit, it's got soil on it. Um, what do I do with it, to, uh, you know, to clean it up? Um, I, I don't like the practice of dipping the fruits in water just because um, you uh, have open wounds. You have wounds that you can't even see on the pumpkin. It's, uh, you know, and, and no pumpkin's perfect. It's gonna have abrasions just from growing. Um, so you're introducing water and potentially a bacteria into those pores. Um, so I don't like a dip. Um, and I really don't like a lot of pressure washing because that can do damage as well. Um, but what you can do uh, is basically just take a damp rag uh, and rub it off. Um, and actually looking at uh, seeing whether bleach uh, helps now or not. Um, so that's something like a 10% bleach. Um, I, I can't say that would help or hurt at this point in time, but it's something that uh, we'll be researching as well because I get a lot of questions about uh, bleaching, you know, pumpkins for post-harvest. So, um, so with that, I'm going to move on from uh, the uh, uh, cucurbits or pumpkins and, and go over to brassicas, which um, is a pretty important crop in uh, numerous locations in Virginia. Um, and uh, there are some, you know, pretty severe disease problems that we are encounter, encountering uh, this year and in years past. Uh, Alternate area leaf spot and head rot uh, has really increased. So that's the one I want to talk about first. Um, we are uh, part of a USDA funded project um, between University of Georgia, Cornell and Nebraska. Uh, where we're actually trying to look at controlling alternate area, um, particularly on broccoli, but also other uh, crops as well. Um, so I'm going to show you some slides of this disease. If you have a problem um, or you know of a grower that's having a problem or uh, you're just curious if you have alternate area in Nebraska's, um, give me a call, shoot me a text, email. Uh, I'd love to talk to you. Uh, one of the things that we're, we're trying to do is come up with a, a library, so to speak, of all the different alternate area isolates that are here in the Commonwealth uh, and on the East Coast to try to figure out how we best can manage this um, through uh, fungicides and not only fungicides, but resistant varieties as well. Um, so one of the things that you see with, uh, and this is a field of broccoli, uh, and, and the reason why I wanted to talk to you about this is um, we actually have weeds. We have brassica weeds that could be a host of it as well. Um, but uh, what it looks like, and this is on broccoli, you see these uh, little round spots. Um, and uh, you can see them in the leaves first. Um, here's a little close up of what they look like. Uh, they look like a bullseye. Uh, this is very similar to early blight and tomato. Alternaria produces a pretty characteristic um, bullseye type lesion. Uh, and actually here, these are, are fruiting. You can see actually the uh, black spores here forming by alternaria. Um, that's, you know, and if you're growing collards, you know, or, or something like that, uh, this is really a problem because it, it's, you know, going to decrease your marketability. Um, and broccoli, it may not be quite as big of a deal on the leaves, but where it really does damage and where we really struggle with control um, is within when it gets within the head. Uh, so in the picture here on the right, you can see these little portions where we have some form of uh, browning, yellowing. If you open that head up, you actually can see the fungus growing down within this broccoli head. So again, this is a, a big problem. Um, we've 
that we've seen in or have. Um, this can sometimes be confused with bacterial rot in brassicas. Um, and uh, again, it, it's just a matter of, of uh, the circular round bullseye type lesions versus these um, kind of angular lesions that come in on the margin of the plants. Um, I hate to tell people to diagnose disease by smell, uh, but man, this thing is really, uh, really foul. <laughs> so if you have broccoli that's it's really, uh, really pungent and odor, it more than likely is bacterial versus uh, alternaria, which is doesn't really have quite as much of a scent. But, but let's face it, all brassicas stink when they're and they're in decline. Um, we really had a problem with bacterial rot in 2018, uh, but that was likely due to a really, really warm September um, and fall, and there was a lot of rainfall. So this uh, winter or this fall has differed a little bit and that we certainly had the rainfall, but we haven't quite had the warmth that we did um, uh, in 2018. So it really blew up. Um, this is mostly caused by pseudomonas and disease prevention starts with using certified seedlings um, transplants uh, seed. So you want to make sure you're getting from a reputable seed source uh, to start. So with all that being said, um, these are two diseases that we have seen this year. And, um, uh, you know, really it's a, a spray program uh, on every seven or, or 10 days um, from transplanting on. Uh, you need copper in there pretty much every time to help deal with uh, bacterial issues. Um, I don't really differentiate between the coppers. There's some that I like better than others, just from a formulation standpoint. Um, but uh, you definitely need some copper in your tank. Um, you can use chlorothalonil or Bravo again as a protectant also, uh, and that's helping with the alternate area. But really the, the, the chemicals that I recommend for, for alternate area are quadris top, uh, and then alternate that with Fontella's. So you have um, Quadris Top, which is a mixture of azoxystrobin and diphenylconazole. That's a strobilurin and a triazole. And then you have Fontellus, which is a HD, a SDHI uh, fungicide. So you're throwing three different modes of actions. And here they're like Tom talked about the uh, uh, Iraq groups. We have FRAC groups, which are fungicide resistant uh, action committee designations. Um, that uh, lets you know what the mode of action is. I will warn you not to just solely rely on quadris. Uh, so don't go out and make straight quadris uh, applications. There's a large population of alternaria um, and brassicas that seem to be resistant to that. Again, that's something that we're trying to document and get a little better idea of uh, through the research program that I mentioned. So. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about are, are cover crops. I get asked a lot about uh, brassica cover crops and um, how uh, they can best be utilized against uh, for disease control in 2021. Um, and again, plant them in the fall. We're getting to a point where um, if you haven't planted them, you really need to, to, to start getting them in really quick because we're running out of time. Um, and the importance of that is basically the more biomass you have, the more beneficial it's going to be. So planting them, you know, much later than now, you really risk not having a lot of biomass in the spring. Um, and the reason why brassicas are effective is they produce material called isothiocyanates or ITCs. Um, and to give you some idea of, of efficacy of that metabolite, it's actually one of the big um, degradation metabolites produced by methamsodium sodium that's effective. Uh, methamsodium sodium is a fumigant that was used, uh, still used, um, to a certain extent called BAPAM, or uh, there are some generics as well. Uh, but again, the more biomass you have, the more ITCs you're going to have produced. Now, with that being said, there are some um, brassicas that have actually been bred to be cover crops because they produce a lot of ITC. Uh, an example of that is Caliente. This is an arugula that's basically uh, been bred for mass ITC production. 
Um, and you'll see this uh, in you know, your, your seed listings. Um, and, and Caliente is really not cheap. Um, or some of these others aren't really cheap, uh, but they are good options when utilized properly. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Uh, they can you know, give you pretty good broad spectrum. I'm gonna use the word suppression. I'm not gonna use the word control here, uh, but they can help with your nematode and soil borne disease populations. Uh, the big part in this, and I, and I tell people, it, even with brassicas, it's not so much which brassica you use, and, and uh, it, it is making sure you do it properly. So basically, you're going to plant it this fall, um, and then in the spring or late spring, you're going to go in, and there are two processes that have to happen for you to get much of any benefit from these brassica cover crops. Uh, First of all, you've got to break the cell. You've got to break as many plant cells as you can. So as you can see, if, if you don't break that cell, you don't have a release of isothiocyanates or the biofumigant. So you've got to break those cells. And then as soon as you break that cell, you have to incorporate that broken plant material. So something like a flail mow, um, you know, mower rototill, these are great because they break a lot of plant tissue along the way and they put it into your soil ASAP. So again, if you're going to utilize, if you're going to pay the money for something like Caliente, you've got to make sure that you use it properly. Um, if you're in a no-till reduced um, tillage system, you're just not going to get that benefit. Again, you, you have to break cell tissue and then you have to incorporate it to get the biofumigant uh, efficacy or activity out of it. So with that being said, um, start looking towards 2021. There are a couple of uh, items I, I wanna put on your screen already. Um, you know, as we're wrapping up 2020, destroy those crops as soon as harvest is complete. Uh, the longer you leave it out there, the, the more time you give pathogens. Um, an opportunity to multiply the same can be said for insect and weed pests. Um, seed treatments. I uh, really want to uh, use a lot of, um, you know, it, it, I recommend the seed treatment for pretty much any vegetable crop that you utilize. Um, and, and go ahead and use the premium, such as farm or It is a small investment in most cases. Uh, and from the insect and, 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 pathogen standpoint it is well worth it uh, it'll it'll pay off more times than not and uh, you know even if it pays off once in every 10 years quite frankly to avoid a complete uh, crop failure it's worth it um, managing scalp for insects early and I know I'm not trying to step on Tom's feet here I'm just trying to say that we had a lot of problem with viruses this year uh, being transferred uh, emitted by aphids, uh, but particularly cucumber beetles. Uh, so you really want to keep your eyes out for, for insect populations early on uh, because you could end up with a viral or a bacterial uh, problems uh, due to these vectors. Again, stress crop rotation for your vegetable crops. And uh, I know this is a, a brutal thing to hope for, but really we need a cold winter. Uh, Tom mentioned, you know, pickle worm and, and us usually not seeing it. Um, we're seeing a number of soil borne pathogens, um, you know, fungal pathogens. We're seeing an uptick in nematodes. Um, and I'm not blaming weather on all of it uh, because we're fumigating less. And, and there are a couple other things that contribute to it. But I think in 2020, we really paid for a mild winter over 2019, 2020. Uh, and we've had a couple of mild ones back to back now. Um, we really want some cold weather to, to knock some things out. Um, so with that, uh, I'll wrap things up. Uh, feel free to, uh, again, uh, text, call, uh, email, um, whatever you need to, uh, to get in touch with me. And with that, I'll uh, wrap things up. All right, thanks, Steve. Appreciate you joining us, and, and thanks as well, Tom, for the insect update. Uh, I just was taking a look at the chat box, and, and Steve, I see a question here that I think uh, will pertain to you and your presentation. 
Um, the question is, do you think late season diseases like soybean rust could potentially become a larger issue in edamame in a few years if it continues to stay warmer longer year after year? Okay, so uh, soybean, soybean rust is something that um, um, you really can, can hurt, you know, that you've heard a lot about um, uh, probably, I would say, about 15 years ago when it was introduced into the United States. Um, it is what we call an obligate parasite, but the upshot is it basically doesn't overwinter um, in our area. So it has to come up every year from uh, as a number of uh, vegetable and, and row crop diseases do. It has to come from areas like South Texas, uh, the Gulf of Mexico, uh, Florida, where, you know, there's never really a frost to eliminate all hosts. Um, so, I mean, it, it could be an issue. Uh, we've monitored for soybean rust, you know, ever since 15 years I've been here in Virginia. Um, and it hasn't really caused a, a ton of problems. Um, but again, it, it is something definitely to keep on the radar. So particularly for edamame, because um, what we're seeing in edamame is that uh, we don't have the disease resistance packages uh, that you generally see in, um, um, you know, uh, conventional soybeans or GMO soybeans. So you just don't have the disease resistance packages from the breeding efforts from the last century. So. We, we also had a similar question, um, and, and Tom was able to respond to that in the chat window, but just for folks that may be listening just to audio, uh, the, the question was that it seemed like Virginia seems to be adding one to two growing degree days every year, uh, and some pests are showing up and becoming a problem, like you mentioned, Tom, uh, about pickle worm and, and some of the others. Um, and, and it was just asking about the impact that that may have on IPM strategies, you know, in, in 10 years or, or for the upcoming seasons for some of these crops. So Tom, you, you had a really great uh, answer to that question. Would, would you like to just talk about that a little bit as far as your, your response on awareness and education? Yeah, sure, Robbie. Um, yeah, I think it's something that uh, we are strategically located um, in this country to, to really show some impacts because we're kind of in a transition zone of, um, you know, we, if anyone's going to start seeing southern pest problems, you know we're we're really suited for it because we're kind of right on the right on the fringe anyway, and that's exactly what we're seeing is just um, these things making their way up. Probably a lot greater survival of of these warmer climate adapted insects, um, and you know the the uh, increase in temperatures also increases development time um, or, or or rate, so they're going to develop quicker, which means possibly you add another generation um, to some of these insects. So that's, you know, brown marmorated stink bug, I didn't bring that one up, but that's a, um, that's an insect that we're starting to figure out why we get some of these years that we have these just hellacious outbreaks in the fall. And, um, and a lot of it is tied to how many survived the winter the year before, because that's going to be how many adults kick it off in the spring and start laying eggs. But then if, if it's warm, if it's warmer, they will be able to get through another generation, um, a second generation of, of like that, that stink bug. And which means you got two generations of adults then that could be going into overwintering. So we're, we're, we're starting to learn some of these things that, um, man, you know, you start messing with climate and, and it's going to really change things big time. So it's a great question. It's something that I think we, the, the first step is awareness. And that's what I put in my answer is that, you know, the specialists need to know that these things are out there. Um, like for instance, if, if I didn't have Helen on the Eastern shore conducting a, a trial on, on edamame, um, I would not be aware that Southern green stink bug is, is, um, becoming a major stink bug in, in some parts of the state. Well, that's a Southern pest, it always has been. Um, and it's a bad stink bug, it can build up to really big numbers. And it's like, dang, we're dealing with that one now too. Um, but 
it's really only out on the eastern shore that I know of it, but it's probably elsewhere. So, so that's a great example is, you know, awareness. So extension agents will play a big role in helping to diagnose that these things are there. And then it's just education after that. Um, I, I, for instance, would start by looking at my colleagues um, south of here, NC State, Georgia, um, and just, you know, hey, how do you guys deal with this insect? Because we have it now. And, um, you know, you know kind of building off of their years of experience. So, yeah, it's just going to be awareness. And then um, we may have to change things up. It's likely going to be greater pest pressure. Thanks, Tom. I, great point. I, I think that was really worth mentioning and, and I appreciate your, uh, your efforts in addressing that. I think, like you said, it's something we certainly need to keep, keep managing. Um, any other questions this morning? We'll, we'll open it up now for questions for both Steve and Tom. So um, I continue if you have any to put those in the chat window, but if you have any questions uh, that you'd like to, to ask either of the speakers, uh, you should be able to unmute yourselves. You should have that ability now to do that. So uh, just go ahead and unmute yourself and, and ask any questions or comments at this time. Hey, Steve, I have one for you if no one has a question. Um, this is one that I that I need to know personally for, um, for my research plots, but I think a lot of the other folks on here would want to know the answer to this too. And, um, you know, picking the right fungicides and the rotations can get really complicated. And uh, if you had to tell me, Tom, I would advise you to buy these two fungicides <laughs> for uh, cucurbits and just general fruiting vegetables. Um, and, you know, just kind of like, what's a, what's a really simple answer, a really simple kind of a nice preventative um, option to, to just simplify it for me personally, because I, I get lost in trying to understand where I'm at, which one I should have gotten, um, what's become resistant. So what do you have for me? Well, um, yeah, I, I get this one actually and quite a bit because, um, you know, and I realized that not everybody wants to go out and buy uh, 10 fungicides or that they have the acreage to go out. And so some of these fungicides you have to buy, you know, like um, a decade's worth <laughs> to get just the smallest amount for particular growers. And, um, you know, one of the, uh, one of the materials that I, I really stress, and it's been around forever, uh, is chlorothalonil, or what we would call Bravo. Um, that's a protectant material. Um, we don't, it, it's a multi-site um, material. Quite frankly, we don't even know uh, uh, the many ways that chlorothalonil interacts and, and, and inhibits uh, fungal growth and, and reproduction. So, um, you know, from a resistance standpoint, it's a great material. Now, the, the downside to, to Bravo or chlorothalonil is that um, you have to uh, ensure that you get good coverage. So you can't go out and, and just, um, you know, you've got to pay attention to your spray pattern and, and making sure that you get good coverage. Uh, so like with uh, cucurbits, um, you know, you, if you're spraying it and you want powdery mildew control, for example, uh, you really got to get it to where you even get coverage on the underside of the leaves. Um, so you've really got to fog it, um, utilize something like 40 gallons to the acre or higher, um, you know, to really get coverage. Um, and, you know, the other thing I think um, that, that, I would, uh, and there are a number of ways you can go about this. Um, you know, probably 10, 15, 20 years ago, I would have said that Quadris would be, or Cabrio, uh, a Strobelian would be my recommendation, uh, but, but not anymore just because it, it's really um, not, you know, there are a lot of resistance problems with them. Uh, so what I would say is you could go out and get something like Quadris Top or something like um, uh, something like pristine uh, that that have combinations of strobilurins and another fungicide, uh, so you kind of broaden that spectrum out. So 
um, again, I think uh, you go you you go a long way with with chlorothalonil, um, and and then utilizing a material that's got a couple of different fungicide mode of actions in it uh, would would help you out quite a bit. Um, there's certain crops where you can't use chlorothalonil, and you would have to uh, uh, go with something like mancozeb, which is manzate, or you know some various pinkozeb, uh, various other trade names. Um, so that's another protectant that you could utilize too. So hope that helped. Yeah, it does. Okay. I wrote it down and I'm going to go buy them. <laughs> so Bravo and Quadra's top. All right, we had a question there. I uh, see a couple more popping up in the chat window. So I'll just try to read those out. And, and if anybody wants to, to comment or add any additional information, feel free to. Uh, one question was, are there any pests that cannot withstand the warmer temperatures? And, and Tom, you replied that brown marmorated stink bugs uh, don't do well in high heat conditions and they typically seek shelter in trees and field edges. So I don't know if you have anything additional that you'd like to comment on that or, or if you wanna move forward to another question. Yeah, I think there's fewer that the warmer temperatures are gonna hurt them, but that's one where um, I do have some data and we have studied it and it's it's why you don't see them in a in a cotton field in south side Virginia um, brown marmorated stink bugs that is uh, it's too hot for them and they, they actually love to feed on cotton and do very well on it, but um, you know they that's just the, the the temperatures are just too high for them. that's the only one I could really think of offhand though I see we got another question here, uh, and this will go to Steve, I believe, um, is, is there any data uh, on the amount of nematode control from the usage of flailed or plowed under brassicas as a cover crop uh, in grain crops, and, and that was followed with conclusive data. So, uh, Mike, I see you were the one that asked that question. I know here where we are in Eastern Virginia, we tend to have a lot of nematode issues. Uh, in, anything you'd like to, to add, Mike, or, or Steve, on that topic? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I can talk um, a little bit about, uh, you know, field crops, it, it's, uh, uh, yeah, there's there's some data out there. I personally don't have any, but I know a number of people have utilized the, the brassicas. Uh, and again, and I, I'm not going to say it's going to completely reduce or, or manage your nematode problems. Um, and with nem nematodes uh, in particular, you really need a, a program like a, a integrated pest management program to uh, live with them because you really, I don't even want to use the word get rid of them because uh, it's just not that kind of pest. You kind of manage it, um, you suppress it. So uh, you can utilize something like that um, where you are um, you know, you can grow brassicas. Actually, there are some brassicas that won't uh, go. You know, that do well in warmer conditions. So, if you're if you're planting a grain crop for like October, um, there are some brassicas that you could grow over top over the summer, uh, and then utilize it as a, a biofumigant. Um, but there's that data out there. I can look and see what I can find, Mike. Um, but I don't know if it's something that we've done necessarily here in Virginia, but. Um, again, the, the, the big thing is getting a lot of biomass, making sure you get the tissue broken and then incorporating that. So, and it'll help. I mean, you know, with, with something like uh, grains, um, you, you probably want to look into, you know, an amount of side seed treatment or something like that. So, uh, and crop rotation to help, you know, manage your, your problems. Thank you, Steve. Um, we're just seeing out here, and well, where, where you get to, but on the edge of the coastal plain, we're seeing a lot of uh, increased nematode pressure. We're seeing hot spots get larger and spread across the field, and and um, a lot of the brassicas, I think, are, and I'm no vegetable expert, but I think a lot of them are winter winter annuals, and just wondering about the, the ability to put them in flail them and, and, and perhaps climb under for some sort of at least control. I just yeah, didn't know I, if it was, I didn't know if it was conclusive data or not. 
Well, it's, it, it will help. Um, you know, it's better than doing nothing at all. So, um, but, but like I said, it, it's one of these things where people um, uh, want to just plant the brassica and then basically, um, you know, move on and, and uh, but, but you really got to do that, that process of, of breaking the tissue and incorporating it to get anything out of. If you do that, you will get some benefits. And, and I see Tom in the chat responded, that'll help with wireworms as well. And, um, you know, wireworms and, and nematodes are pretty similar uh, in nature. So, uh, but I mean, you know, uh, like I said, more than anything, I think it's got to be, um, you've got to get the incorporation. So, Thank you. But that will certainly help. Uh, one other thing while we're on cover crops, and this kind of touches on, on uh, Laura's uh, you know, comment. Yeah, there's a lot of interest um, uh, out there. One of the things that um, uh, I do want to warn people about, and, and this doesn't happen every winter, but if we keep having these milder winters, um, if you put out something like a hairy vetch as a cover crop, uh, that actually is a very good host for root knot nematode. Um, so, you know, there are some benefits to hairy vetch as a cover, of course, from a, of a you know, nitrogen level standpoint, but uh, things like hairy vetch can be a uh, host for, for root knot. Uh, so that's something to consider, so. Steve, I see we have one more comment there uh, in regards to the far more seed treatments that you mentioned for the fungicide and insecticides. And, and the question was, can you treat uh, seeds with that yourself or is it a controlled product and process? And, and Tom responded to that and said, as far as he knew that it, it can only be applied by a certified seed dealer. And any comments additional to that, Steve? Nope, Tom's got it. It's, uh, it's only, and far more, I will mention this, far more is not the same for every crop. So there are some different, um, uh, you know, mixtures that go into the farm more based upon whichever vegetable crop you get. But 100% Tom's right, you can't, uh, you can't do that yourself. It has to be um, applied by the uh, dealer or distributor, so. But Steve, following up on that, um, the individual, uh, products that go into, you know, far more, at least for cucurbits, is three fungicides and, and then the neonicotinoid insecticide, thiamethoxan. I know um, you could almost make, make a seed treatment that would be comparable, um, at least I know from the insecticide end, there's, there's things you can treat your seeds with that would, that would give you the same as the thiamethoxan, and maybe Steve could comment um, the same with fungicides, and you know, you basically make a comparable, you know, um, one that you can apply to the seeds yourself. It, do, you, do you know about that, Steve, whether there's any, any of the fungicides that you could apply? Yeah, so um, to, to be honest, uh, it, it, um, the, the one of the fungicides, fulioxanil, you really can't get uh, on its own. Um, and then you have mepinoxum, which is uh, Ritamel gold. Um, and Ritamel gold direct contact on a lot of seeds is not a good thing, um, even though you can use it, you know, as a PPI. Um, so for the little bit of extra cost that you incur by buying it, um, I think it's worth it from the fungicide standpoint, just because it's almost uh, impossible to make that mixture of the three. And they all kind of serve their own purpose. So I can't tell you one's more important than the other, so. Yeah, that's a real point about the cost. Um, I think I looked at it once and it, it, at least for cucurbits was ridiculously cheap, like less than five bucks an acre. Um, and then ended up coming out too. And it was like, my goodness, that, that additional cost to your seeds um, is clearly worth it for all the things that you're getting with that. So I, I, I agree with that. Steve, 
Steve and Tom, I, I think I would also maybe throw in there for folks, you know, especially folks that maybe are interested on smaller production scale and stuff that that seed treatment is typically commercially available on some of the uh, companies that do sell vegetable seed, you know, some of the co larger companies for commercial producers, but they also sell retail as well, I think. So that if there's anything y'all can add to that, but I have seen that myself. All right, just checking the chat window here. I don't see any additional questions. So in, any other questions or comments um, for the speakers this morning? Had a great discussion, a lot of great questions and answers that have been, been touched on. Um, last call for any, any questions or comments. All right, well, Steve and Tom, thank you both for being with us this morning. Great presentations, a lot of great information and updates. So I think this will be a, a valuable resource to producers here in the state as, as well as elsewhere um, for vegetable production this fall and for coming years. So thank you both for your time this morning and joining us. Yeah, you're welcome, Robbie, and and uh, all you agents. This, this is a really great thing you're doing. I think we're hearing some of those numbers of um, people that are looking at these presentations. I, I think it's great. I appreciate it. I would assume Steve will comment as well, but for us, we know that um, our information is getting out to a lot more people than probably ever before. So um, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Th thanks again, Tom. We appreciate you and Steve being with us this morning and uh, I'd be remiss, as you said, I'd also like to just take a second and recognize the, the other agents that make this effort possible. Uh, Laura Maxine, Stephanie Rommelcheck, Trent Jones, and, and Mike Broad. It's just always like to recognize them and thank them for all their efforts with the program as well. So I uh, appreciate everyone being with us this morning. Uh, you can find the recording link, the link there on your screen that's shown now. Um, if you would like to share this recording of today's presentation with anyone that may benefit from that. Uh, also, next week, as an announcement, uh, our, our speaker next week is going to be Mr. Robert Harper from Virginia Farm Bureau Grains Division, and we're going to be having a presentation on some general basics for grain marketing and, and also a brief update on the current grain marketing situation, both in the U.S. and globally. So uh, if you're interested in grain marketing or your grain producer, please join us next Thursday morning. Uh, you see the link there on your screen, same time. And place at 9 a.m. next Thursday. So please join us for that. Uh, finally, I'd just like to ask folks, uh, if, if you've joined us for the program this morning or you've joined us for previous programs, please take a moment to uh, fill out the evaluation link for the program. Uh, if you need that link, please contact one of us. I believe it's also sliding through on some of the slides, so you should see that. Um, just take a few moments to fill that out. If you have topics that, that you're interested in and would like more information on, please let us know and we'd be glad to try to put a program together with some speakers to address those topics. So just like to thank everyone again for, for joining us today. Hope it was an informative presentation for you. Thank you again to our two guest speakers, uh, Steve Rideout and Tom Kuhar. Appreciate all you all's hard work and, and dedication to producers here in Virginia. So thank you. Stay safe. I uh, hope everyone stays dry today and, and has a great rest of the Thursday. Take care. Thanks, everybody. I uh, echo Tom's comments. I uh, really appreciate the, the venue. And uh, if you have any questions, let me know.